weather. Okay, so welcome everybody to our presentation as part of our Seed Saver series. And today's topic is gonna be pollination, traffic and so on. So we are, there we go. Here's a few housekeeping. Um, the presentation will be recorded. Feel free to ask questions as we go along and you can put them in the chat and I'll be monitoring the chat or you can also put them, um, you can unmute yourselves and feel free to jump in. I have my camera off here. I'll turn it on real fast just so you know. I am indeed a real person coming to you from uh, Claremont here. Um, so thanks again for joining. Camera's off to save bandwidth. If my audio cuts out, feel free to put something in the chat or don't be shy, unmute yourself and say, hey, we can't hear you. And we'll see if it's me or if it's on your end. And then, if you go to our website where you registered for this class on the left hand side of the website, although the graphics on the right hand side here, then under recent presentations you see with this arrow down here at the bottom right of the screen. That's on our website on the left hand side and it will take you to recordings and um, resources related to this presentation. Our website's been having a little bit of difficulty so if you don't find it up there right away, uh, maybe check back tomorrow or the day after. You can also save the resources that I'm gonna drop in the chat at the end of the presentation. If you're on a laptop or a PC um, or a desktop computer, I don't know if this feature works on the phone or on a tablet, but um, you can click the three dots on the upper right-hand side of your chat section and save those chat links. And if that doesn't work, you can go to the recent presentations. So we're the San Bernardino County Master Gardeners, part of the Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Each county has a program and each Master Gardener program is made up of trained volunteers who go through about a six month course and they share peer reviewed research with the public on a variety of, variety of topics. And in our county, we like to focus on growing food, sustainable landscaping, and just generally better living through gardening. We also have several other programs in our county. Each county has a cooperative extension office. Um, each county in California and there's cooperative extension offices throughout the United States. And in our county in San Bernardino, the other programs we have are FNEP, a nutrition program. We have 4-H is one of our programs. The Master Food Preservers is another program. And then we have the Master Gardeners. And then we also have academic advisors and they work with the public as well on natural resources, horticulture, dairy, urban ag, and more. So if you wanna learn more about that, I'll drop that information in at the end of the presentation and that can be found um, on our county website. We have a seed library as part of our master gardener program here in San Bernardino County. And um, the locations that we have have been in Montclair and Ukaipa and we're looking to reopen our Ukaipa location soon, maybe not at the same place, but probably nearby at a community center. And then we'll also have a location in Montclair or potentially uh, Ontario open soon where we can share free seeds again. We also often share free seeds at our information tables at public events. And then we do free seed saving classes and we'll bring those back to our physical locations. But right now they're online and today is one of those presentations. So just a real quick break from our regularly scheduled program. Um, I recognize about half of your names. So you've heard this before and if you wanna go grab a drink of water or stretch for about two and a half or three minutes, I'll move through this. And if you haven't heard this, then I encourage you to give a listen. So just sharing information about citrus greening, also known as Huang Longbing. This is a disease that is fatal to citrus and all of the citrus relatives. It's not harmful to people if you eat the infected fruit, but if the fruit, um, if the tree is infected, then the tree will die. And so this disease has been found all over Southern California. You can see that it's been found in San Bernardino County, in Los Angeles County, Orange and Riverside, and most recently in San Diego counties. So this disease, this bacteria, has been found all over Southern California, unfortunately. It's spread by a tiny insect called the Asian citrus psyllid. It's about the size of a half of a grain of rice. 
And this insect carries the bacteria, the deadly bacteria, in its gut. And as it feeds from plant to plant, it spreads the disease. The same way a mosquito would spread malaria, for example. Once infected, the early symptoms on the tree are asymmetrical yellowing, like this leaf here. And then the fruit becomes discolored and starts to become green, hence the name. And then it becomes bitter and misshapen, and it's inedible. And the tree, once infected, will die. Um, currently, right now, there are no cures available. Um, it wouldn't hurt you to eat it, but it would taste terrible, and your tree is going to die. If it is infected currently, right now, we don't have any treatments. So I just wanted to point out a common insect that you'll see in the fall. <clears throat> Excuse me, actually, you probably won't see the insect. Here it is, the citrus leaf miner. Tiny little insect that comes out at night, and it lays its eggs, and it, the egg, uh, the larvae, hatches and it travels around inside the leaves and it causes this disfiguration. This is mostly cosmetic, very common in Southern California. I'm seeing it on my trees right now. It's seasonal, spring and fall. And again, it's mostly cosmetic. So um, the best thing to do is just leave the leaves on there and um, the tree will sort of outgrow it and it's seasonal again. Now here on the right, this is this deadly disease symptoms. And it doesn't look nearly as bad as this, but this one is mostly cosmetic. And this one are the early symptoms of this fatal citrus disease. So there's three steps that we can take to prevent the spread of this disease. One, and especially on the holidays, don't share wreaths or decorations with citrus leaves. Citrus make such a nice decoration because they'll stay green. They have that nice color in the winter and they'll last a long time but you can be sharing that small insect. And you also wanna take your cuttings from your citrus trees and it's preferred to put them in the green, um, in the trash, not in the green waste. So you're not spreading those insects. Because you see here again, this is the blow up of the insect. It's about the size of a half of a grain of rice. And then you see here on the lower left, here are the eggs, very tiny eggs. And so it's easy to spread the disease without knowing, I mean, spread the insect without knowing it when you're sharing citrus with stems and leaves or wreaths or anything else like that. So you don't wanna share any of that. This is what your fruit should look like. You don't need to wash it, but you need to remove the stems and leaves and give it a wipe. Don't share any cuttings. The tree will take a couple of years to show the initial symptoms of this fatal disease. And so you can have a piece of uh, citrus cutting that looks clean and it's healthy looking, but it's actually carrying the disease. And then you wanna keep ants out of your trees and your plants. And this is true of all of your garden plants. The ants do have a role in the garden as decomposers and even pollinators, but they also will harbor and protect harmful insects. So this is the small Asian citrus psyllid. They'll do the same thing with aphids because these insects secrete a sugar dew, a, a honeydew, or a sugary like solution. And the ants, they don't eat the insect, they actually protect the insect and they will eat this sugary solution. So if we keep the ants out of our plants, which is from your trees, to your vegetables, to your herbs, to your roses, to everything in between, then that will allow the beneficial predators to come in and do their job. So a couple of common beneficial predators that you might see in your garden, are the surfid fly, or it's also called the hoverfly, and here is its larvae. The larvae eats a lot of insects like aphids and the Asian citrus psyllid, and the adults, they primarily feed on nectar, but they do eat some insects. There's a parasitic wasp, which also feeds on the Asian citrus psyllid, and then one of the more common ones that we mostly all know about are the ladybugs, which are great beneficial predators, and here's what the larvae looks like. So if you see these in your garden, on the right hand side those are the good guys and so together there's more there is a praying mantis and all different kinds of beneficial insects so if we keep the ants out of our trees and our plants then the beneficial insects can come in and eat those bugs which pester us if you want to learn more about managing ants in your yard and managing your ants in a least toxic method then there is a link to our uc integrated pest management site which is our main go-to as master gardeners. We love this site, lots of great information and um, talks to you about how to have cultural practices which protect your plants from things like ants and all those other bugs which are bugging our garden. 
and also talks about least toxic methods. If you'd like to learn more about citrus screening disease, the university has a great website as well. And I'll drop all those links in the chat at the end. There is a black fig fly, which is a new pest in Southern California. And if you have figs and see a lot of dropping of your figs, and maybe this um, type of discoloration inside, that might be a sign that you have that insect in your yard. And there is a website. You see, again, I'll put this in the link in the chat also. Um, that uh, UC Integrated Pest Management site also has information about the black fig fly. So that is it for my public service announcements. If there are no other questions, or any questions, sorry, nobody's asked any questions. If there's no questions, then I will continue with today's topic. Okay. <clears throat> so again, today we're talking about seed savers series are pollination traffic control. So this is a topic that um, a lot of times when we do our seed saver presentations, some of them are really basic like or introductory like how to clean tomato seeds or how to ferment tomato seeds or how to harvest your seeds. Um, seed saving 101. We talk a little bit about plant breeding sometimes. So we sort of go from really general topics to really specific topics. And pollination traffic control is one that we almost always mention, but don't specifically focus on. So my goal today is to focus on just this one aspect of seed saving and feel free um, to share information that you have if you're an experienced seed saver, or maybe you don't consider yourself an experienced seed saver, but have just had lots of experience. And to me, that makes you an experienced seed saver or if you're a beginner and you want clarification on something. So feel free to put questions in the chat or unmute yourselves um, as we go, okay? So we're just gonna cover three topics. And in that, I think that we'll cover, it's sort of a, it's a pretty straightforward, the traffic control is pretty straightforward, but there's a few different elements to it. And so that's what I'm hoping to explore today. So we'll talk about basically why you want to do some traffic control. And so we'll talk about what true to type means. We'll just look briefly at some cool season crops. While you may be able to harvest some seeds from your warm season veggies, there's not a lot you can do to traffic control what's already happened. If you have fruit from a warm season crop, then most likely it's like a winter squash or maybe some late zucchinis or squash or tomatoes. Maybe it's pumpkins. And for the most part, all of that pollination has happened. In the spring, we'll have the same talk and we'll focus on warm season crops. So I'm looking to, for today's talk forward to what we can plant in the cool season and how we can con traffic control those things specifically. And then we'll talk about the actual act of traffic control. And then I'll share with you my resources. I have one main resource, but I broke it out into different pages because I've had to um, learn it, the, the, the resource has a lot of information. And so I've kind of broken it down for you guys a little bit. So we're going to try, oh, typo there. We're going to talk about true to type and what that means. So true to type you know is um, something that is a main part of seed saving and the main frustration of seed savers the main opportunity for exploration with seed saving this is uh, taking us beyond just the physical act of seed saving and thinking about what we are trying to accomplish in our seed saving now some of us want here in the center these perfect tomatoes some of us may be looking for these funky, cool heirloom tomatoes. And then you've got all kinds of imperfect produce. But no matter what the produce looks like, then we generally, when we seed save, want something that's true to type. So for true to type, then um, let's back up just a little bit and talk about plant breeding types to consider. Not sure that's exactly the right title, so I'm workshopping this here with you guys. But basically you have hybrid open pollinated 
and heirloom seeds. And so once you've planted something, say, you know, I'm kind of an accidental seed saver where I'm like, oh, something has gone to seed. I will harvest the seed and I will try to grow it. And I have about a 50% success rate because when you step in at the end of the process, then you haven't controlled these factors initially, which have a big impact. And so when we look at these three different types, hybrid, open pollinated, and heirloom seeds, what type they are and what we're going to do in, tra in terms of traffic control, these things are interrelated and interconnected. So a hybrid seed is, or a hybrid plant, common one that I like to bring up is an early girl tomato. That's a tomato that has uh, certain uh, qualities in its skin that it's bred for and certain flavors of the fruit that it's bred for. So that's a hybrid. It's a cross of a uh, result of uh, cross-pollinating two plant varieties. And it's important to understand that this can be intentional or naturally occurring. So with early girl tomatoes, it's an intentional cross and it is a, a F1 plant, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, and that is an intentional cross, but hybridization can also occur in nature. So all open pollinated plants, um, some of them are going to be potentially hybrid because of the pollination that has occurred naturally. So a hybrid can be intentional or have intervention by man, or it can be naturally occurring. Then you have open pollinated seeds. And these are this is pollination with no restrictions. So it can be, uh, occur by wind, by insects, by bees, by hummingbirds, by ants, um, by humans, and more. So hybrid plants um, can be open pollinated and cross pollination can occur naturally. So this can result uh, in a hybrid or a plant that is true to type when properly isolated. So an open pollinated plant can give you something that is a cross, or it can give you something which matches its parents, okay? An heirloom variety is a term that you commonly hear. And this is a term that really doesn't have a technical definition. And so according to Seed, Saving, uh, seed Savers Exchange or seedsavers.org, it's an open pollinated cultivar that has been grown and shared from generation to generation within a family or community. Some uh, sites list the definition being something that's been seed saved from for more than 30 years. So they've grown the same variety for 30 plus years. Some sites say going back to before World War II um, and some are a little bit less, more general like this definition here. So when you hear the word heirloom, an heirloom seed is going to be open pollinated and it's not gonna be a hybrid, but some of your hybrids might also be a result of open pollination. So this is something that's taken me several years to wrap my head around because you sort of have arrows going in all different directions with these. So a hybrid again is seed saved from, uh, or a hybrid is a cross between two different parents. So if you think back to genetics, I think that would have been in high school, you have like a parental generation and they cross and you get an F1 for the first filial generation. And then, so if you have two different parents, so you have two different kinds of pea plants and they crossbreed, then they may all look like one of those parents. So this is the case with the early girl tomato. But when you seed save from those plants, you're gonna get some variety you're gonna get some of that grandparent or that parental generation and some of uh, the two different elements of the parental generation. So the main thing about seed saving from hybrid plants is it's uncertain what type of plant you will get um, and which genetic uh, properties and qualities they'll take from their parents. So this matters if you're growing open pollinated seeds Remember that those things can cross naturally. So just because you buy an heirloom variety or an open pollinated variety, if you're not traffic conducting or controlling the pollination or even just being mindful of the pollination, maybe there's nothing you need to intervene or step in on, but you need to be mindful. You can naturally get hybrid varieties, which are two different types of 
plants, maybe all of their fruit looks the same, but when you save their seeds to grow it out next year, it's not gonna look like what you expect. For open pollinated varieties, these are most commonly used in seed saving and they will most likely be breed true or be like the, what you expect, but you'll still need to do some traffic control possibly for successful seed saving. It doesn't mean that it will breed true. I go through one more and ask you guys if you have any questions. Heirloom varieties, it's just a type of open pollinated plant. Like I said, it's not a technical term and it's not needed for seed saving. So you don't have to seed save heirloom varieties, but you do wanna usually seed save from an open pollinated rather than a hybrid variety. And sometimes people like to grow heirlooms not only because they um, are uh, you know, an open pollinated type of seed, but it's also a way to preserve old varieties. And these are seeds that have been grown for many generations with much success. So this is a shout out to the Heirloom Festival up in Santa Rosa. They didn't have it last year or this year, but there they've got their um, heirloom squashes so that they have their big mound and they do put these to good use after the festival. They're not just discarded. But that's a little bit more about heirloom, hybrid and open pollinated that we'll use those terms as we go along. I do just wanna add gen GMO is a genetically modified organism. Um, it's different than a hybrid, and it's something that is not, most home gardeners, you're not gonna have an, even an option to buy air, uh, genetically modified seeds. Sometimes you hear stories about corn and people growing corn and their corn gets contaminated with genetically modified corn. That's usually on a commercial scale, and that's on crops that are not grown generally in California. So we may not be, or at least in urban areas of California, we don't have huge areas of corn that we grow out here. So while genetically modified organisms get a lot of attention, it's usually not something I see a lot of seed packets in the nurseries and the garden centers that are labeled non-GMO. And they don't even make GMO seeds of that variety. It's actually quite a short list of GMO seeds. So I'm not trying to cast any judgment one way or the other on GMOs in this context. Just know that this is a seed that you are not gonna interact with usually as a home gardener. And um, most of the plants that you purchase, all of the plants that you would purchase in a nursery or garden store, those would all be non-GMO. So just be aware as you're purchasing, if that is um, part of your purchasing decision, seeing that wording on a seed packet um, is sort of, um, you know, it's, it's more for sales than having actual meaning because a lot of times they don't even make a GMO of that type of plant. And so here you have a banana here on the right. This is not a GMO. This is what bananas look like before we modified them through natural selection or through selection over hundreds or thousands of years. We want the seeds of these bananas to be smaller so that we have more fruit. So corn is another example of an organism that we've shaped in the way that it grew, it used to look quite different and we have harvested and selected ones that we like and grown that way. So there is sort of um, a long history of hybridization and selection that goes on, but just know that GMO isn't really part of this conversation for the home gardener um, and politics and all those other things aside, the corporate policies and whatnot. Okay, do you guys have any questions about those four terms? before we go on. I feel like, and feel free to interrupt me and unmute, or if you're typing something in the chat, I feel like this sets a good framework for us to talk about this topic. But again, I appreciate you guys joining in me sort of workshopping this topic because it's usually something that we just loosely talk about, but we don't talk about specifically. So when it comes down to traffic control, what do we wanna do? Maybe we wanna stop pollination. We wanna keep plants from crossbreeding with other varieties or members of the same family. And we'll talk more about that. Maybe we wanna prevent pollination from reaching a flower that we wanna seed save from. So a good example would be if you had lots of different kinds of squash, maybe you wanna seed save from one type 
but it can cross pollinate with other squashes. And so you may isolate that flower after you've hand pollinated it. So we're preventing the pollination from reaching the flower. Or maybe on the flip side, we're encouraging pollination, encouraging that plants are, or ensuring that plants are pollinated for fruit production. So this is um, something that is going to be a lot more important in our summertime varieties of edibles. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. So there was a question that says, can we save seeds from heirloom plants? And absolutely. Um, you can definitely save seeds from heirloom plants. You can save seeds from open pollinated plants. And if you save seeds from hybrid plants, you may or may not get what you're expecting. So we'll talk about that in just a minute. But yes, you can seed save from heirloom plants because they are a type of open pollinated plant. And open pollinated is what you're gonna wanna look for. Good question. So when we go back to, I realize this slide should have probably been at the beginning there, but when we go back to what is true to type or breeding true, then true to type as the name sounds means that, okay, if you've got a green zebra tomato and you seed save from that, you want that seed that you plant to look like a green zebra tomato and taste like a green zebra tomato. So that would be called true to type. Another term um, is sort of used interchangeably is breeding true. So here you are, you know, we get, I, I know when I first started seed saving, you get so focused on the saving part, but really half of the exercise is then growing it out and having it be successful. <laughs> and the saving part of the um, seed saving is often much easier than the growing it out and having it create something that you expect it to create. So that's what this whole talk is about, is, is uh, increasing your chances of success. And so true to type, it basically gives you what you want or expect your seed to yield. Um, and we'll talk about that second part in just a second. And then a hybrid plant, you could still seed save from hybrid plants. In fact, tomato seed saving is um, something that there is a lot of information from online. And sometimes like online, random online pest management advice is like not great or planting advice is not great. Um, there's a lot of um, questionable information out there. When it comes to tomato seed saving, I haven't run across a lot of questionable information. Um, and there's several large groups that um, focus just on tomato seed saving. And a lot of them swear that the hybrid plant, early girl, that when you seed save from it, the seeds or the plants that you get, even though it is a hybrid, gives you a fruit that looks very much like the early girl. And again, the early girl is chosen because it has good skin thickness, it has good flavor, um, and has a combination of those qualities. So a hybrid, in, and when you're beginning to seed save, you can seed save from hybrids and maybe you'll get something really interesting. It doesn't mean that that seed is defective or it's not gonna grow. Usually what it means is that it's just, you don't know what it's gonna look like. Another example is peaches. Peaches will drop seeds and they're very easy to sprout. And most of the time those seeds will yield a tree, which makes tiny green peaches that never quite mature. So it can be um, you know, unsuccessful. You get a peach tree, it makes pretty peach flowers, but you don't get a peach fruit. And so because those peaches are so heavily pollinated, they are cross-pollinated or they revert back to some sort of genetics, which don't give us an edible fruit, even though they do give us a peach tree. And so as you become a more advanced seed saver, you may want to create hybrids. You may have a tomato that's got this amazing skin. It's just the right thickness, not too thick, not too thin. Uh, maybe it has a beautiful color. Maybe it has a, a great flavor. Maybe it's disease resistant. Um, and, and you wanna cross these two plants because you've got these different qualities. Then you may actually, in your career of seed saving, you may start looking for hybrid, hybridizing and making your own seeds. And then what you do is over time, you keep growing them out and you save the best of the best. And eventually they will start to breed true 
because the genetic variation will sort of get um, uh, bred out of it. And that's what heirloom seeds are. So when we talk about hybrid seeds and their qualities or true to type or breeding true, I just want to note that there's two different types of breeding true or true to type. You have something which is uh, phenotypic, or you have with a phenotypic breeding true, like it looks like the parent. And most of the time as gardeners, that's usually all we're concerned about. And then there's also genotypic um, gene expression, which is down to the DNA and the genetics. What is its signature? And so to illustrate that, um, I just want to point out, because especially in herbs, you'll get things when you're doing home seed saving, which are going to be a phenotypic match. And I just want to introduce the term to you. You don't need to really remember this. But basically, the phenotype will look like the parent. And so a lot of times in herbs, if you grow basil, it probably looks loosely like the basil that you harvested it from, but it might not be genetically matched. So if we think back to our high school genetics, and you've got the pollen of two plants. This is probably, just in case you're interested, but you don't have to remember this part. This is probably, this would be a crossbreed. Um, this plant right here would be a crossbreed of um, a double B, like this one, and a double little B. So this is probably this, and, and I'll just geek out on this genetics for just another minute. It is way more in depth than you need to know. So um, this plant right here is probably a combination of two big bees and two little bees. And so this one would be a hybrid because it's got a big bee and a little bee. So we have a big bee parent and a little bee parent. And this would be an F1 generation plant or first filial. And so when you crossbreed, these are two, they have the same. So these are two hybrid seeds or two hybrid plants. And when they crossbreed, their seeds are going to be one of these four. And so that's where when you have Mendel's genetics and you have a white pea and a purple pea and you crossbreed them, they're all purple. But when you save the seed from them, some are purple and some are white. So something that is phenotypic match, looks like the parents. It's purple. In fact, actually all three of these would be a phenotypic match because they look like the parents, they're purple. But you're gonna have this one seed, which may, one of the plants you grow is probably gonna not look like the parent. This is gonna be, this is gonna be your peach or your early girl tomato. It's looking so good. And then one of them is totally weird and doesn't give you good fruit you saved and grew out four seeds, for example. Okay, phenotypic match means that it matches the parents exactly, which is only two of these right here. So even though this one looks the same, it doesn't actually genetically match the parents. The parents are hybrids. And so, but what we mostly care about is does it look and taste the same? Okay, this is something that is really specific and deep and may not be of that much interest to you and is not something that you really need to know to seed save. You guys have any questions about this? And so, the, and this is all related to why we want to control the pollen. Okay, so I'm going to clear the drawings and I'm going to go on. Double check. Chat, nothing there. Okay. So, what can crossbreed either in a good way or a bad way? And it's all the plants in the same family. So a big cool season veggie that we grow would be things in the brassica family. That's arugula, bok choy, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, kale, kohlrabi, and more. These things can all cross breed and it's why it's very hard to save seeds from the brassica family. Carrots can cross breed with parsley, for example. So when those cross breed, you might get something cool or you might get something totally useless in terms of your garden. Same thing with um, different uh, peas and different plants here. You can see that marjoram, mint, oregano, basil, sage, thyme, they're all in the mint family. 
so they can crossbreed a little bit. So this is important, understanding which family the plants come from. When you're thinking about seed saving and what kind of cross-pollination you want to prevent usually. Okay, so let's just look at a few cool season crops real quickly. So the characteristics of a cool season crop is basically that they do well in cool weather and they tend to bolt in warm weather, sending out their flowers. So a good example of that is broccoli. They also grow well with the shorter days. I just put in here, they're less susceptible to moisture damage or are more tolerant. This is not a research-based com uh, comment. This is more personal observation and it doesn't apply to all plants. So I wanna qualify that third bullet point as that may not be, research may not prove that out. But they can tolerate or need cooler soil. There are some cool season plants like Brussels sprouts that need to be planted in the end of the summer because they want that warmer soil. Um, and it's also a way for us to grow veggies and herbs that won't tolerate our warm summers like lettuce. Lettuce can grow year round, but it usually doesn't tolerate the heat of our summer. And the cool season plants are usually, the edible parts of the plants are usually leaves and stems and shoots and roots. So in the summertime, we're usually having the fruits of um, our plants that we're harvesting. So we're naturally letting these plants go to flower. And this is something that we really need to adjust our thinking in the winter time, because in the winter time, most of the things we harvest, we don't let go to flower and it eliminates our opportunity to seed save. Um, but we eat a lot of let leaves, we eat a lot of shoots and roots and modified stems in the winter. So some cool season veggies are gonna be peas, carrots, broccoli, radishes. The peas are one of the only fruits that we eat that are grown in the winter time. So this is something that would go to flower and it forms its pea that has the seeds inside. I wanna note that when the peas are ready for us to eat, they are not mature and they're not ready to be saved from. They need to dry on the plant. Carrots are one you typically wouldn't let to go to flower. Broccoli, these are immature flower heads. So when broccoli goes to flower, it's usually considered a failure on our part because the broccoli didn't make it or the weather didn't cooperate. So with these things, when we're gonna seed save, we need to be intentional, not like with peas where we can just leave them on the plant because they're going to flower. But that also is helpful in the winter time because if you have low pollinators or you have a lot of pest pressure and you screen your plants, then a lot of these plants don't need access to pollinators like our summertime vegetables do. But that will impact our seed saving. Radishes is another one. You usually don't let it go to flower and to seed. But I wanna point out here, these are the families and both radishes and broccoli are in the same family. And so these can crossbreed if they're pollinate, uh, if they're flowering at the same time. Many lettuces can grow. Here's another brassica family. We have our cabbages, the herbs fall into many different families and celery, which is in the same family as carrots. So those things may crossbreed. And if you're growing them together, then their crossbreeding can mean that you'll get an interesting seed that you don't want um, or a seed that's highly successful that's weird or it may match the parent exactly and you may get lucky. But this is where we need to do that pollination control. So here's the traffic control part about it. You guys have any other questions before we go on? Um, I'll sort of talk about the how. I think I've talked about the, the why and the what and maybe the where and the who. Well, that's the traffic control. Okay, I don't see anything going into the chat, so I'll continue. So I just want to add a few more definitions. We've got uh, pollination, um, a few definitions to break out here. The po uh, pollinize is to supply with pollen. So this is the aspect of the traffic control. This is the part we're trying to control. So pollinizing is to supply with pollen. And to pollinate is to convey the pollen to a stigma and, a stigma and allow fertilization. A pollinizer is another plant. Um, in this case, they were talking about fruit trees. So a pollinizer is another plant, but it could be another vegetable. A pollinator is going to be an insect or another animal that pollinizes. It could be us. And then fertilizing is when that's actually happened. 
So if you think about broccoli or you think about cabbage or radishes or carrots, you don't need a pollinizer. You don't need to pollinate anything. You don't need any fertilization to occur because we're eating the immature plant. So when you're seed saving for cool season veggies, you need to do one of two things. One is to have a separate area that, okay, carrots, if you're gonna plan to seed save carrots, which by the way, take two seasons to seed save from, so they would be ready next fall or next summer. Um, you need to have those, leave the carrots in the ground. You're not gonna harvest the carrots. You're gonna let them go to flower. If you're seed saving from cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kale, broccoli, you're not gonna harvest that plant and you let them go to flower. So sometimes that happens on accident because we got hot weather and the plant just what they call bolted and it went to flower before you expected it. That happens a lot of times with basil and cilantro. It will just all of a sudden go to flower. And so if that happens, maybe instead of pulling that plant, you wanna consider leaving it and letting it form its seeds. The pollinators love, you know, we never think of our vegetable gardens as being pollinator gardens, but they have this amazing potential to. And in the winter time, the only real potential is when you, we don't harvest that edible part. So I say either, you know, grow a separate area or maybe plant like 10% more. If you're planting 10 plants, then maybe um, plan to harvest eight of them and save two of them to go to seed. Some plants are self-fruitful. So the pollen from one flower will pollinate the pistil of the same flower. So that's true of tomatoes, for example. Some are partially self-fruitful. It will set some fruit, but it will set far more with a pollinizer. So the examples listed here are fruit trees, but that's also true of peppers. For example, bell peppers um, are partially self-fruitful, but do well with fruits from other uh, flowers from other plants. And then some are completely on, um, they need like a squash. Um, usually it needs to, have, it needs the pollen from another, um, either the, I guess it would be partially fruitful from itself, but it often has a challenge of the pollen getting to the flower at the right time because the male and the female flowers, so they are not self-sterile. Um, the male and the female are usually on the same plant. That's the same with cucumbers. Usually they'll set the male flowers first, and then about 10 to 15 days later, they'll start setting female flowers. But sometimes you need to hand pollinate because the flowers aren't open at the same time of the day. A lot of avocados have a male and a female flower that are not open at the same time of the day. And that's why you need a couple different types or two different types, an A and B type of an avocado. So when you're thinking about all that pollination and we're thinking about the traffic control, then comes in the term isolation distance. So there may be, when we're thinking about summer fruits, we're usually trying to encourage pollination. We don't really care where the pollen comes from as long as it's from, you know, if you got 20 varieties of tomatoes, we don't really care which tomato it comes from. If we got 20 varieties of peppers, we don't care which tomato, I mean, which pepper it comes from because we just want it to get pollinated so that it will set a fruit and then we're going to harvest that fruit. And if we're not saving seeds from that fruit, we don't care at all about where it is. So uh, with strawberries. Um, with bell peppers. Those are two plants that a lot of times when you have poor fruit set, it's because of a lack of pollination. And the second time we're thinking pollination, 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 and that is great for eating fruit, but when we're thinking about, and we'll do this class again in the spring, and we'll talk about the traffic control that's needed, um, you really need to know which plants you need to guide the pollen. So, okay, I'm gonna seed save from this tomato. So I need to make sure it's not getting pollen from all the other tomatoes, for example. Um, so that's something to think about for the summer. But for the winter, when you're seed saving, we really don't care about the fruit. It's really usually when we're letting it go to flower, we're wanting it for those seeds, or maybe it's for pollinator food, which then it doesn't really matter. But when we think about the seeds, we often need to isolate the varieties that we grow in the winter time. And the most common one to think about is the brassicas. So again, that's the broccoli, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, kale, um, radish, things like that. And so isolation distances is how you can make sure that those seeds will breed true or they'll not get cross pollinated or cross, I'm gonna use the word contaminated um, even though it's not really, there's nothing wrong with the seeds, but the seeds aren't gonna give us what we expect. 
So the isolation distance is how far a plant needs to be from other plants of the same variety or family to prevent cross-pollination. So it really is the opposite of summertime veggie gardening because you're always trying to encourage pollination. Not necessarily cross-pollination if you're seed saving, but without pollination, you don't get any fruit. And if you don't have proper isolation distances, then you're gonna get these different crossbreeds. Some of them may be great, but some of them may not be what you're looking for. So the resources that I'm gonna share predominantly with you are from Seed Savers Exchange. And they have two really great charts. This is a shorter chart, smaller, more simple chart, and then they have a little bit more expanded chart. So you can see for some of these plants, the bean only needs to be 10 feet away from other varieties of beans in order for it to be successfully seed saved from. And then you have beets. Beets need to be 3,200 feet from other beets because it crosses with Swiss chard. So this is a great chart because I don't remember all of this stuff and I understand the concept, but here it tells you, if you wanna save beet seeds, watch out, they're gonna cross with Swiss chard. If you wanna save cabbage, it's gonna cross with other varieties. Carrots can cross with Queen, Queen Anne's lace. So this is one of the resources I'm gonna share with you. And then they have a more um, in-depth version. So when we get to the end of the presentation, which is in just over 10 minutes, I will be happy to walk through this chart with you live, um, but I wanna make sure we have time to get through the content. Um, but this also gives information. So again, with the bean, it only needs to be about 10 feet from others in the bean family. And here it tells you what family it is. And for the broccoli, it needs to be 800 feet to a half mile from others in the brassica family. So controlling cross-pollinations, there's three different ways to do it. One is by distance, one is by time, and one is by mechanical barriers, okay? So I hope, um, as, as I continue to learn about seed saving, I always find when I present, I understand it better than I can explain it. It's a complicated process. And so I really want to cry. First of all, I hope this presentation has so far been helpful and not confusing, but I just want to encourage you if, if you know you showed up and you're interested in seed saving, it is a journey. And every time you are exposed to something, you understand it a little bit better. So if this has been a little bit confusing, maybe it's something you refer back to next fall or in a month or in a couple of weeks and you continue to do research and it will hopefully um, continue to unfold as it has for me. So we're going to talk about three methods of controlling cross-pollination and I hope that the framework that I've set up so far has um, give you, given you a good reference point on why cross-pollination and controlling it is important. So with uh, controlling cross-pollination by distance, the goal is to have flower, the goal is to avoid having flowers close enough for most methods of cross-pollination um, um, occur. So we don't want the flowers to be too close. This can be more or less successful depending on how easily a plant cross breeds. Like you saw the example of a bean, which doesn't crossbreed very easily, and that's just a characteristic of that family, or a broccoli, which crossbreeds very easily. Corn is another one which crossbreeds very easily. It's usually a good place to start if you're willing to take your time. Um, so creating distances between your plants, and this can be done in a smaller yard with a little bit of strategizing. So um, this is culture control through distance, but I also think it kind of falls under the category of mechanical barriers. I couldn't quite decide where to put it, but you're basically trying to create some distance, either like you could have a fence, which may discourage pollinators from crossing from one. Now this is kind of an extreme fence. This is also an extreme hedge, but this is the way where you can create a distance. You can also plant them if you have a large enough gardening space far apart so that they're too far apart for cross-pollination to typically occur. And this is what we want to avoid, is to have all of the brassica families in a square foot garden piled up on top of each other here on the lower right-hand side. So we want to create physical distance. This can also be done by planting um, 
uh, barriers. And so we'll talk more about that with mechanical distances, uh, mechanical methods of separating your plants. But you basically, if you create distance, if your beans are more than 10 feet apart, now this could be, remember if you're growing five adzuki beans and five long bean or five uh, bush beans or something, then um, you can have the same variety close together. So all the adzuki beans together and all of the bush beans together, but you wanna put about 10 feet of distance between them if possible. Um, and so uh, good question, Sandra. And then I'll probably, let me get to that right at the end because um, that's a good place to wrap up. So there's a question in the chat and I'll get to that in just a moment. So you can create a physical distance. You can also prevent cross, cross pollination through time. And the goal here <clears throat> is to avoid having flowers that might cross pollinate in an undesired way um, open at the same time. So if two flowers are not open at this, if you have a broccoli and a cabbage, yes, they'll cross pollinate, but if their flowers aren't open at the same time, there's no concern about cross pollination. So we have to remember that just having those plants next to each other doesn't mean they're gonna cross pollinate if we are strategic. So here you have a cabbage and you have a radish and the cabbage thinks it's 10 o'clock and the radish thinks it's six o'clock. These plants were put in at different times. They were staggered plantings. And even though you have a radish right next to a cabbage, the radish is flowering, the cabbage is not. No, no cross pollination is gonna occur. And this is a really great strategy in a smaller garden when you maybe wouldn't have the distance. You know, most of us don't have 800, 1600 feet to separate our brassicas, you know, our broccolis from our cabbages. But if they're not flowering at the same time, there is no concern. And the third method of controlling the pollination is by mechanical methods. And so the goal, once again, is to prevent cross pollination through mechanical methods. And some of those methods could be pinching back the flowers, for example. Covering the flowers is another way to do it. So with pinching back the flowers, if you have two things pollinating, um, flowering at the same time, like two different kinds of broccoli and they're flowering at the same time, then you would maybe have to pick. Um, I normally, I can't really think of a circumstance where pinching back the flowers, that's more for summer things, like a tomato where it's gonna create fruit again later. Um, so not too applicable, um, but like for example, with the beans, if you grow, or peas, if you grow two different types of peas next to each other and they happen to be flowering at the same time, but you want this one type of pea to breed as true as possible, and they're two feet apart, then maybe when one of them flowers, because it's a continuous flowering process, maybe you pinch back those flowers for just a little bit so there's not cross-pollination. You can also cover the flowers, can pollinate, and then secure the flowers or create a distraction. Um, well, here's my distraction here. I was saving the bullet point. Um, or create a distraction, okay? So maybe with your tomatoes, if there's one plant that you really want to seed save from, tomatoes is usually not as much of a big issue. Um, a great place to start seed saving from because they're generally self-pollinating, self-fruitful. But you could pinch off the flowers. Um, you know, with a kale or a broccoli, they only really set out one set of flowers. So if you pinch it back, you're not gonna get any flowers again. Whereas with a tomato, it might flower all season. Um, but then you may want to cover the flowers with a cloth, a mesh, a screen. And so this would be a way, for example, if your kale and your broccoli flowered at the same time, you could cover the one flower set with um, mesh to prevent that cross pollination. Um, you can hand pollinate and then secure it. And I have a photo of that. So I'll talk about that in just a second. And another recommended method for the seed savers exchange, which I thought was funny, but probably totally makes sense, <clears throat> is if you don't want cross pollination to occur, consider creating a distraction for the pollinators and creating a pollinator strip that would attract their attention away from your vegetables. So I thought that was an interesting strategy. Um, this is from another presentation, but I wanted to show you these um, screens. And so what you have is a, a screened in garden here on the lower left, and you can open these um, like vents or patches. And so when you close it, these things wouldn't have pollinator access. 
So if you had broccolis over here and cabbage over here, then you could open and close these as different things for pollinating. So they may be close together, but you can prevent the pollination, for example, of one, or maybe have one open for a couple days and then open the other one for a couple days and switch off that way, sort of controlling the flow of that pollen. With things like this, if you have hoop houses, you can set up mesh. This is plastic here, but you can also put mesh over to stop pollinators from coming in. Um, this same, this type of hoop house that has the gopher mesh is to keep pests out, but you can put mesh over that as well if you wanted to stop the pollination in that bed. Um, this one as well, um, you could have mesh over that gopher wire if you were trying to stop the pollination. So like this picture in the back, or the back of the picture here has some frost cloth and that would keep pollinators out of that bed. So if, for example, all your broccoli went to flower and you were gonna save seeds and then it happened to be all your cabbage went to flower, you didn't want cabbage seeds, you wanted broccoli seeds, then cover the cabbage um, temporarily while those broccoli seeds are maturing. Um, and um, so you can also just lay mesh. Here's the inside of a mesh, like a gauze type mesh. No, the type of mesh, might discourage pollination, but it won't prevent it because it's open on the end. Um, and then there's this uh, other method I mentioned, which is securing your flowers. So this is some sort of seed that they want to save and they don't want it to cross pollinate. So they've got a fancy bag over it. Um, this is a less fancy. This is a squash, um, some type of squash that they or a cucurbit that they want to seed save from, and you notice that they have a tag so they know which flower they probably hand pollinated it, and after they hand pollinated, they closed it. And that will keep other pollen from coming in, so they'll know the origins of the pollen. Because it's important to remember that this squash plant will make all of the same type of squashes, but the seeds will be different depending on where the pollen came from. So here they've hand pollinate, pollinated it, Maybe they made it a hybrid. Maybe it's a cross-pollination. Maybe it's not, but whatever they've done, they've then controlled it. They've traffic controlled it by closing it off. You can also tie the end of the flower or put like a gauze bag, like I showed in the other picture um, here, where they used a gauze bag to stop future pollinators from visiting that plant. So on a squash, maybe you wouldn't do that to all of your squash maybe you're going to eat most of your squash and it's important to note that the squash that we normally eat is immature but maybe this one because it's tagged we're going to leave it on and this is the one squash because you know squash makes a lot of seeds you really only need to seed save from one of the flowers so just two more slides and then i have my resources i know we're at 4 30 so i'll wrap up and then i can uh Take your last questions and the question that was already in the chat, and I can show you guys the guide as well really quickly. So this is just an example of how you would implement this. And so this is um, going to be um, how you would traffic control for broccoli success. So this is getting broccoli seeds that would bleed, breed true. So the first thing you would do is pick an open pollinated or heirloom variety. Remember that all heirloom varieties are open pollinated, but not all open pollinated are heirloom. You may want to pick a hybrid variety and see what happens. See how the genetics play out and see what type of seeds. Some people like that kind of adventure in their life. But know what you have. Then you want to decide, okay, so the broccoli is in the brassica family. You want to decide, how many brassicas are you gonna grow? Are you only gonna grow broccoli in your garden? Are you only going to, are you gonna grow broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower and kale and all of those? And then that's gonna decide if you're only growing broccoli and you're gonna hope that your neighbors aren't all growing cabbage and kale because the cross pollination can occur on that level outside of your yard for brassicas. Um, if you're growing one, then probably you don't need to worry too much about controlling that pollen. But if you're growing five different varieties, then you're going to need to use some of these intervention steps, like creating mechanical barriers, like creating some physical distance. With a brassica, that's really hard to do in a small yard. But with beans, for example, only needing 10 feet of space, not that difficult. 
So if you are going to grow several varieties, then one of the things you can do is to create that space out of time. And you figure out how many days to harvest. So say the brassica takes 120 days or 90 days to harvest that broccoli. Then remember that it's 90 days to harvest the broccoli, but the flowering is going to occur after that. So if you have a broccoli that takes 90 days and a cabbage that takes 100 days, you probably want to plant those about 20 or 30 days apart so that they're not flowering at the same time. And so then that's doing these approximate calculations. And then basically you're just going to monitor the flowering of all of the brassicas in your yard. And if you see that, oh, my cabbage is flowering and oh, the broccoli is flowering, what am I going to do? Maybe you cover up that uh, broc uh, cabbage for a little bit. And my recommendation for the cool season veggies that are more difficult, like broccolis, brassicas, you know, that whole family, is to maybe just start um, planning to seed save from one of them this year. Um, beans or peas are much easier to seed save from, so that may be a good place to start. I usually recommend tomatoes as a good starting place for summertime seed saving, and peas as a good place for um, wintertime seed saving starting. Okay, so do you guys have any questions about this timeline? And this is just sort of an example, sort of taking what we covered today and kind of putting it into a thought process. Now this thought process would be different for carrots. Carrots take two, two seasons, which is like a year and a half to make fruit and you need a minute or make seeds and you need a minimum of like five carrots because they need to cross pollinate amongst each other. So for each plant, this traffic control timeline is gonna be a little bit different and that's why I recommend you start with one so that it's not overwhelming. So basically you wanna, in, in pollination traffic control, if you are like me, where you're sort of a haphazard seed saver, I'm very good at seed saving, I'm not that great at seed planting, and I'm not that great at getting seeds that actually give me fruit because I don't take control of my destiny in the beginning and know which pollen I want to encourage and which one I want to discourage. I'm kind of, uh, I think I need to retire to have that level of attention, but it doesn't take a lot of attention if you start small and little by little, and that's what I've been doing. Um, and it will take time to perfect. It's the one thing that you know I love about gardening is there's always new things to learn and new frontiers to cross. And so this whole aspect of successfully, like anybody can seed save, but being a successful seed grower from seeds that you have saved. Not only do you want them to germinate and actually be able to grow, but you want them to look like what you expect them to look like. It's a lifelong process and it's one that's very rewarding. So start with one or two varieties each season and then know your pollinators and what they like to do in your yard. So I'm gonna share with you a couple of resources. Um, I'll drop these in the chat. So a lot of these are the same website, the Seed Stavers Exchange, but they're different elements of the website. So, oh, I forgot to put this one in there. I'll add this one. Um, and so I'm going to open the website really quickly and show you a couple of these guides. Um, also, I encourage you to sign up for our newsletter so you can find out about our upcoming classes, including more seed saving classes. Check out our social media pages. And always feel free to reach out to our helpline if you have any questions. I'm gonna drop the links in the chat real quickly in case you need to go because I know we're a few minutes over. Um, and then I'm gonna show you the websites that I referenced. The one that is missing that I didn't add, um, you can download it from the link of the website above it. So a little bit of redundancy in there. I just wanted to take you to all of the different aspects. There was a question while I'm opening the website about how to store your seeds. And the best place to store your seeds in some places that's cool and dry. And some place that if you are having something that's sealed, then make sure your seeds are thoroughly dry and make sure that um, maybe I recommend putting like a silica gel packet or something to keep moisture as the biggest enemy of seed saving success. So I usually put them in envelopes. I put them in a place 
where pests like uh, rodents and moths are not going to get into them. And I store them in a cool, dry place. And that is something that we'll start posting more of our presentations on YouTube. And we do have presentations that we do about that, specifically just about that topic. So let me make sure I might have double dropped that last one in there. Oh, I did. So it's really only those two sets of resources. But let me show you really quickly the Seed Savers Exchange. And um, if you guys have any questions while I'm showing this to you, you guys can uh, drop them in the chat. If you need to go, thanks for joining. And so um, we're not promoting them as a business. They have some really great seed saving information. Um, the recording uh, question was about the recording. It, it can be found on our website. Um, if you go to our website, I'm gonna upload it there. And the recording, it, it will link you to our YouTube channel. Um, so again, it looks like this. It's on the right-hand side, I mean, the left-hand side of our website and recent presentations. And then um, for fellow master gardeners in our county, I will try to upload it to our internal system, but that hasn't been working recently. So it will be found on our YouTube channel in the next day or so. Um, Oh, great. All right. Thank you, Sander, for joining. So just really quickly under programs and resources, here's where you can find that seed saving chart. But notice that it redefines all of the columns. So you'll see these bold, uh, large words, and it describes what those things mean. And when you open it, then here are those words. So I love this chart because it tells you on that previous page, what each column means. And I have to reread it a couple times. So we've got our crop, what the species is, the family, because those are the ones we have to watch out for crossbreeding. This one will tell you about the life cycle. And I know we're 10 minutes over, so I don't wanna spend too much time, but it just, if it's every year or if it's a couple years or if it's um, you know continual life cycle, it will talk about the primary method of um, pollination, which will help you when you're trying to control pollination. It will tell you how close or how far. I worry less about the actual numbers and pay more attention to, okay, beans and barley is really close, close 10 feet, 20 feet. Beets and broccoli are really hard, 800 feet to a half mile. So I generally, I don't follow this exactly, but it just kind of gives me, is this something I could even do in my backyard? Or do I need to control pollination in another method? This first column here under population size is the main one I pay attention to. And this is to get viable seeds, which means seeds that will sprout. And this is where I realized that I saved one carrot for two years. It's a biennial life cycle, so it takes two seasons, which is just a little over a year. But I only saved one and the seeds were hollow. They wouldn't even sprout. And it's because I didn't check my chart and I didn't see that I needed to have five plants of the same variety. Okay, so there's lots of different elements of this. Um, this is that simplified chart, which um, talks about you know, crosses, kale crosses with rutabagas, leeks have short-lived seeds, um, melons cross-breed with Armenian cucumbers. This is just some great information here. Um, and so um, lots of things to read, lots of definitions. Um, so the Seed Savers Exchange is my go-to for this kind of information. And I suggest printing it up. And anytime you plan to intentionally save seeds, pull out your chart and see what's going on. Or you could be like me where I accidentally saved my carrots, but I only saved one and when it went wrong, then I pulled out my chart and I figured out what happened. <laughs> so with that, I don't think there were any other questions in the chat and we're like 11 minutes over already. So if there's nothing else, I am going to sign off. It's beautiful weather here in Southern California. And I hope you have a lovely day. And this is a great time to plant your native plants. That's what I'm gonna go outside and do right now. And a great time to think about maybe one plant that you're gonna to try to save, save from this winter. For me, it's peas because I'm not that organized. <laughs>
for anything else. And so I'm going to focus on planting peas and seed saving from peas this winter. So that's my goal. Um, start small and build over time. Okay. Thank you everyone for joining us and uh, we hope to see you next time.